and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are honoured that you have chosen to share your time with us on this World Mental Health Day to discuss the importance of making mental health a global priority for your business. My name is Robin Vernon Harcourt and I am the Programme Director for the Global Business Collaboration for Better Workplace Mental Health. The theme for this World Mental Health Day this year is making mental health and well-being for all a global priority. So we are delighted to have so many of you joining us from around the world. So please do take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, sharing your name, your organisation, your role and what country you're joining us from. I have the pleasure of welcoming and introducing our chair for today's event, Dr. Rob McDonald, VP of Health and Hygiene and Chair of the Health Leadership Team at BHP. Rob is passionate about the creation of mentally healthy workplaces and was instrumental in developing BHP's mental health strategy, as well as establishing and sustaining a framework for the management of health risks. BHP are also a founding partner of the Global Collaboration for Better Workplace Mental Health. So we are delighted to have Rob lead us through this important conversation today. Rob, thank you very much for being here with us and over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are across the globe. And welcome to the Global Business Collaboration for Better Workplace Mental Health's World Mental Health Day discussion. Um, I'm Rob McDonald. I'm delighted to be here today as, as chair for this session, um, where we're going to be speaking with, with some of uh, some great leaders who will be talking through their personal experience and also their, their workplace programs, which I'm sure you're going to really learn a lot from. So. Um, Thank you for joining us. The Global Business Collaboration for Better Workplace Mental Health is a collaboration of companies whose leaders are committed to and passionate to supporting workplaces, create environments that support better workplace, that support better mental health. At the crux of it, it's about raising awareness, it's about reducing stigma, and it's ensuring individuals who are experiencing poor mental health are connected to the resources they need to recover and really lead thriving, thriving lives. So we're delighted to have our speakers here today to, to share their experiences and uh, to share some of what they're doing in their workplaces to create better places for, for their people who may be experiencing poor mental health. So I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Elizabeth Bradford, who's Chief Operating Officer for HSBC Hong Kong, and she's going to be sharing her lived experience of a, a mental health issue. In order for us to break down stigma, it's so important for us to be, to be sharing stories, particularly stories of hope and recovery, particularly from our senior leaders. And so um, I'm really pleased that Elizabeth is, is joining us here today and is going to be sharing her story um, which I'm sure all of us will learn something from and, and really benefit. So from a personal perspective, and I'm sure statistically uh, most of any viewers as well, uh, mental health, or rather a lack of, has significantly impacted my life over the years. My father very sadly suffered severe clinical depression and uh, it went uh, not untreated per se, but not really, it wasn't talked about that much. So when he became ill, uh, there wasn't really enough intervention. And very sadly, when I was 14, he actually made a very, very serious attempt on his own life, which for years afterwards, obviously very much impacted both himself, but then my family and everyone else, which is why I'm personally very, very vocal about mental well-being and trying to remove any stigma when people are suffering or need some help in any way, shape or form. I do suffer quite badly from anxiety and I've had uh, what I like to call 1.5 pretty spectacular burnouts in my career and I talk about those a lot as a leader because I think it's really important that people understand that recognising symptoms early, seeking help and treatment, using self-compassion and then really reaching out and, and getting that help whether that be from your organisation or those around you is a really critical way to not only thrive in your personal life but actually even in your career as well. And I work in a lot of environments where people feel there is a stigma 
or that perhaps they um, shouldn't talk about it. But actually, it certainly made my career go from strength to strength. Um, I had a role previously which oversaw all of um, Asia. And I think there absolutely is a stigma, whether that's down to the industry or the area or the culture in which you're operating. And it's a bit of a challenge, but I think that for a lot of people, they're concerned when they're not at a level of seniority that actually it might give the wrong impression. People might not think that they are robust enough or able to deal with challenges when actually it's exactly the opposite. So speaking about mental well-being or challenges around your mental well-being takes an enormous amount of courage. And creating an environment where people can do that also takes an enormous amount of courage at times because you are going against a flow. And I think that's why it's really important with, uh, with events like today. So the support that made the most difference to me in the organisation at the time, with my very first burnout, there really wasn't any. And I was really struggling to emotionally engage, not only at work, but at home as well. Um, and just suffering from a lot of the, the typical symptoms of burnout, with about 76% of people apparently um, responded to a recent Deloitte survey that they have. So even things such as, you know, enormous anxiety, uh, struggling to get motivated, eating issues and, and all of those things. And the first place that I worked actually didn't have any support around that at all. Um, and in that instance, I actually ended up leaving the firm, the country, packed up my life, went traveling for a few months uh, with my husband. The second time around, which is my 0.5 burnout, as I like to talk about it, I thought when I rejoined the industry and I thought when I rejoined a different institution, I'd be able to manage it better. It wouldn't be such an issue. I just wouldn't let it get out of control. Um, but actually about 12 months after starting, I ended up very much close to that abyss again. And I was very lucky to have support in that the, the bank provided me with a coach who actually took me through personal resilience. And actually that coach then taught me all of the fundamental pillars that you can put in place to identify those symptoms early, to ask for help, to be emotionally aware, which growing up in the UK, when I did, you weren't really taught to be emotionally aware. So I think talking about mental health has helped me a great deal just in terms of A, normalising it. So we're all human, we all have up days and down days, some of us have more of each, um, and we all go through different phases in our lives and struggles. So for me, talking about it has helped, certainly from a personal perspective, just knowing that I'm not alone and that other people have gone through similar things or are there to support me. I've also found that because the bank was good enough to give me a platform to then start rolling out wellbeing initiatives across the whole bank, actually the huge reward that comes from doing something like that is the network that you build around it, the fact that other people come forward, they share their experiences, and that sense of community and belonging has really, really helped when times have been stressful or tough because you know that you can reach out to people. So very selfishly, it's been a huge support network to me, but also hopefully because we've been able to roll out programs, because we've been able to roll out initiatives, it's been a huge support to other people as well. So the advice I'd give to anyone who has a mental health challenge or issue is really to not hold back in terms of sharing or asking for support. I think self-compassion is absolutely critical, but making sure you're in an environment where you can trust the people around you to support you, to help you, and if you are lucky enough to have recovered, please, especially if you're in a leadership position, be open with people about the challenges that you've faced because it's an amazing impact. You may never know. Maybe it's that you're creating a psychologically secure environment. Maybe it's that people feel that they can then come forward and you never know. You could be saving someone's life by simply role modeling what it means to reach out and, and how to get better. So I think the GBC pledge is absolutely critical when it comes to really demonstrating our commitment to a business environment in which people can thrive, um, both from a, the fact that it's just what makes us better humans, but also because it makes perfect business sense. We need to create sustainable and resilient organisations that can do the right thing going forward. And so being a part of this pledge really means we can underline our commitment to that and be very public about it. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your powerful story with us. Um, it's just so important for our leaders to, to help to reduce the stigma to the sharing, you know, their own personal experiences there. And uh, I've certainly learned a great deal from that. And, and really looking forward to you joining us on the panel to share some, some more of those really rich insights, uh, both from you personally, but also through what you're doing at HSBC there. So, so thanks again, Elizabeth. I'm delighted to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Karen Plever, CEO, Global Strategic Accounts at Sodexo. The business case for investing in better workplace mental health is, is, is really clear. However, how you do that when you operate in a multinational company across multiple jurisdictions is really challenging. And so Karen's really well placed to talk through this 
with Sodexo operating in more than 50 jurisdictions across the globe where there are different cultural issues, different stigma related issues to take into consideration. And so really looking forward to hearing from you, Karen, because this is one of the challenges that we experience at BHP as well as to how you've gone about it. Hello everyone, um, I'm Karen Plover. I'm the global CEO for our strategic accounts business in Sodexo. Sodexo is a, a, one of the world's largest employers. We have more than 420,000 people delivering a vast array of services all over the world to people in, in offices, R&D campuses, schools, universities, defence. So, so, so many people that we're responsible for and many people that we are looking after in, in all of our client organisations globally. I have um, more than 20,000 people in the Strategic Accounts Group. We work in a very high pressure environment for clients who have very high expectations of their own employees' health and wellbeing. Um, all of the services we provide contribute to their daily experiences in their working life. And our people are working under tremendous pressure all of the time. Sodexo has a really strong service spirit. It's very important to us. It's sort of in, it's part of our DNA. And sometimes um, I worry that our people in, in the pursuit of delivering that perfect service will put themselves last every time and put their customers and their clients first and how much they are potentially internalizing issues that could create real challenges um, for, the, for their personal health and their mental well-being. Okay, so my personal commitment to, to mental health, it goes very deep because as well as being a leader in Sodexo, I'm a mother, I'm an auntie, I'm a sister, I'm, um, I'm the oldest cousin in a big international tribe. So all of these experiences have been very handy for me in my working life and I really understand the pressures that people are under. So my personal commitment is always to, to really... To be, to, to be that person, to be the role model for, for mental health, to be an empathetic leader where my people know my door is always open, my virtual door, my real door, um, to, to take my holidays, to make sure that I'm always asking them about their families, about the situations that I know they're in, to share very personal things about me. So I think when they can see it, they can also be it. So they can think, okay, this is all right for me to do the same thing because Karen's doing it. And, and really to be, um, you can't always be a friend to everybody, but you can be a warm leader who's listening, who's watching, and who's always on the lookout for the signals to, to stop this, um, this very silent epidemic in its tracks, I think. If people are not top of their game from a well-being perspective, they absolutely can't do a good job. End of story. So there's a real business imperative as well as a personal imperative here. Mental health is um, critically important for Sodexo. We have, as I said, more than 420,000 people. Our mission is to create a better every day for everyone. And we absolutely can't do that if our people aren't at the top of their game. So, so for us, it's, um, it, it goes very deep. It's, it's about our people. It's about the impact our people have on our clients, employees, and all of the consumers that we serve globally. So for us, it is front and center. And, in, and indeed, it's becoming even more important than physical safety, which is equally important to us. But mental health, we seem to be talking about more, and it seems to have really risen up the agenda as a result of all of the impacts of the last number of years. I think when, when this topic first came in our agenda, we thought, wow, this is brilliant. It's very aligned to what we see as critical in the industry. So Dexo has signed the leaders, leadership pledge really for, for a very simple reason. Um, first of all, if you, can't, um, if, you, if you can't see it, you can't be it. If you, can't, if you don't see the words um, in lots of communications coming at you all of the time, you've got to sort of emphasize that message constantly. There's no easier way to do it than to have all of the leaders in the organization sign a well-being pledge which our employees in turn can hold us to. So, so some, some, of the, some of the tactics that we have within the pledge are, are quite basic things, you know, to try and keep meeting lengths down, to make sure people are taking appropriate breaks, to respect people's home life, time zones, all, all of the normal things that you would expect to see. But what it really is, is an implicit contract between leaders in Sodexo and all of the people that work within their teams and in turn between, between the teams and the people who work for them. So, so it has a cascade effect throughout the organization to give us all something to, to hold up. It's like a red card saying, hey, remember we signed this, remember what it means and remember how important it is. 
So I think it's giving, um, it's truly empowering all of our people to, to hold up that red card at the right time and to remind themselves all of the time that this is more than, more than just the words on a page. We have all agreed to this together and we each have a responsibility to create this environment where well-being is, is just our core focus. So, so for me, it, it makes it real. So Texas is addressing this topic across the world, I think in quite different ways, because one thing that we know as a global organization is there's no such thing as one size fits all. The ability that we may have in some markets to talk very openly about this topic, it's quite different. And in some cultures, it can nearly be a taboo. So it's still very much in the in the background. It's not something that people are comfortable talking about. So I think as, as we deploy our well-being pledge, as we start to really have the right conversations, we're very sensitive to having them in the right way, depending on which market we're in, depending on which culture we're, we're working in, and really helping other countries who might be less evolved in this respect, where it's, it might be still a significant taboo to admit that you potentially, as a, as a senior leader, as anyone in the team, are struggling with depression, struggling with overload, struggling with these, these aspects that have impact your well-being. So I think the sensitivity towards that cultural diversity is, is really critical in this topic, because without that, you could actually do damage rather than good. I think it's something that we all need to be aware of. Okay, Sodexo improves mental health for our employees, I think through a number of different avenues. The first one for sure is talking about it. So, so first of all, we, we recognize that it is a hugely important topic and we are constantly talking about it now. We quite often open our meetings with mental health moments. It used to be a big focus on physical safety, but quite often now we will, we will talk about some aspect of mental health and well-being for those first two or three minutes at the start of a meeting. We, we quite often would use those moments to, to amplify messaging about employee assistance programs. And we, we have some terrific um, activities that we have or opportunities that we have for people all around the world in different markets. Again, it's, it's, it's sensitive to the market that you're in. So what's available in the UK, it might be quite different in China. It might be quite different in, um, in Latin America. There's nothing more important than, than really removing any kind of stigma from, from this topic. Because unless, unless we do that, it continues to be underground. And in our, in our organization, people are really, really encouraged to be very authentic. So authenticity is highly prized. If you follow that thought, you can't be authentic if you're not bringing your whole self to work. And if your whole self involves a part of you that's really in pain for, for whatever reason, it could be because of grief. And, and I think that is, the, um, that is the sort of chain reaction that this organization and this collaboration can, can bring to the world of work for many people. To start that chain reaction where one story leads to someone else opening up. One of the ways in which I think we, we as leaders can truly champion this topic is, is by being open about ourselves. I can't believe that there isn't a single person um, listening to this, a single person out there who has not at some moment in time had some impact, something happening in their life that is either devastating, they could be grief stricken at different moments. There's so many things that can happen and we all have them. Um, I think it, if, if we have the courage to be open about the challenges that we have faced, you're just giving permission to everyone else around you to do the same thing. If people see you within your organization as some sort of um, bastion of strength and you, nothing ever gets you down and you can handle anything, you're, you've got huge resilience, etc. If that's the only you that they see, then they're going to feel very uncomfortable to admit that they're not feeling like that today, that they have something going on in their life that's really taking their focus off work, that they need help. Sodexo is all in on this topic. And one of the ways we've done it is that we have signed our leadership pledges on mental health and well-being. And from me to you today, my message is please sign this today. Think about it, prioritize it and sign your leadership pledge today to help us all together have such a positive impact on the lives of all of the people that we're responsible for in our roles, for our customers, for our consumers. Sign the leadership pledge today and be all in. Thank you, Karen, for sharing with us you know, some of your insights and learnings from Sodexo's approach to operating in multiple jurisdictions across the globe. 
Um, I've been taking plenty of notes and there's certainly some of those learnings we'll be applying at BHP. So, uh, so thank you so much. I'm delighted now to introduce our panelists for our next session and just super excited that we've got such great leaders to share their own personal experience and, and what their companies are doing to create better, better workplaces and better support for workplace mental health. Um, so Liz, thanks again for joining us. I'd, I'd also like to introduce Josh Krzyzewski. He's COO of Essence Mediacom. And, and also to welcome Sunita Wazir, who's Global Wellbeing Lead at Unilever. So our first question's for Josh, and, and thanks so much for joining us. We've heard so much about the importance of leadership to accelerate much needed progress in workplace mental health. Essence Mediacom is a founding partner of the GBC in the Leadership Pledge. Why is this such an important agenda for you as a leader? Thanks, Rob. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's amazing to be on this panel with such esteemed other companies um, alongside me. So I'd say, I mean, I'd say, um, so I've been, um, I've been, I've done different jobs at the company that I'm at, at the moment. So as you said, I'm the global COO now, so I have a global uh, remit um, in, in my company, but I've done local jobs and regional jobs as well. And so I think I started when I was the chief executive for Mediacom in the UK um, seven years ago or so was when I first sort of start, started thinking about how both mental health and well-being are critical to uh, kind of this, the, the, the culture that I wanted our business to be. And the reason for that is that our people are our greatest asset. And I'd, I, I think most leaders would say that. Um, I think some leaders probably think about well-being in terms of um, it's just the right thing to do. And then other leaders think about well-being in terms of, well, it, you know, it, just, it drives business success. But I think increasingly we are seeing leaders in the world taking this more seriously, which I think is a really good thing. So from my perspective, really, um, I was working in a, I mean, our company is a company where we do value our people, um, but it's also, you know, obviously, a very competitive industry that we work in. We're a very competitive business. We drive, uh, you know, we have a high performance culture. Uh, we like to win. Um, and what comes with that is, you know, stress um, and sometimes quite an aggressive um, element, I'd say. And that was something that I really wanted to change in the business. Um, I wanted to retain high performance, but I wanted it to be a culture where people could kind of bring their true selves to work and be comfortable speaking very openly and honestly. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think that was sort of at the heart of why this is something that's quite important to me. So, and I think from a personal perspective, I, I suffer when I'm really, when I'm really stressed at work, I suffer with anxiety and I get insomnia. So I actually, bizarre, and this doesn't happen all the time, but funnily enough, it happened last night. So, so I, so I'm, I'm, I'm running on this today. So this is kind of like a live experiment, <laughs> but, but you know, when you have that, when you have that, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't stop thinking about work and you're up for hours, you know, you're just not as good the next day. And that is something that, um, I've struggled with for years and, I really wanted to normalize that. So I speak quite openly about that at, in my company and in, and in, you know, on panels like this to try and normalize that conversation and, and let people know that it's, it's quite common that people have their own struggles and um, it's normal and it's okay. And you can still, you know, be a high performing individual in your role, um, even though you struggle with those sorts of things. So I think that's kind of at the heart of why I think this is really important. And, um, and I think that, you know what I, I suppose my ultimate aim is I want uh, I want a um, I want a, I want the world really not just my company but I want the culture of work in the world to be one where you know people are thriving and people are happy and people love love working and I think that there's a long way to go for that so that's really at the heart of, of, of why I'm here I suppose yeah thanks thanks Josh and and, and look you know I, I fully agree you know support for better mental health is absolutely in keeping with also, you know, driving a high performance company. Um, but so important is the underlying culture and, and the culture where people can bring their true selves to work. Um, if, if they are experiencing that stress and discomfort, can have that conversation with their leader um, is, is, is all about 
um, high performance. Um, but it's about doing so in a way which is which is genuine and caring for your people. So no, look, thank you for that. Um, now, is is this a leadership agenda across all the countries that you work in, and and in particular within the EMEA area? Um, and and what opportunities and challenges are there in the EMEA, perhaps compared to some of the other regions where you're operating in? Uh, so basically, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm not I'm going to make an assumption here about HSBC and Unilever, and I'm going to say I bet that HSBC and Unilever have been quite strategic in their approach to. Um, you know, well-being and mental health in their companies because they're just so brilliantly set up and they, you know, they're so lauded in doing so. I think the, my approach was, as I said, I started in the UK. It was very organic. It came from a, um, you know, I was just in a place where I wanted I wanted people to feel well. And then sort of as we, we introduced various different initiatives like, you know, a mental health ally scheme uh, where people had really good training in being mental health allies and signposting when when people when there were issues and people came and spoke to them. We've got a really good mental health ERG in the UK. That kind of built and built and built. And, you know, we saw great success in our business as the culture changed in the UK. And so then when I took, I've had a few different jobs since then. So I then became the the EMEA CEO um, and I introduced the the conversation into markets in the the EMEA region. I then quite quickly became the global COO and we globalized our mental health program um, around the world. Now we started with 16 markets and now I think we're in 32 markets globally with the Mental Health Ally program. And really the way that we've done it has been, we've got sort of certain services that we offer everybody all over the world, but, and we've got a kind of a bit of a framework for initiatives that we think are good initiatives um, that can work in different markets. But the whole success of, I think in, it, certainly in the company that I work for, the success of any um, w- both mental health and well-being program is is one whereby it's it's kind of owned by the people and it's for the people, and whilst it's important to have sponsorship at a leadership level, it's really important to be owned by people at different levels in the business, and you know just because something worked in the UK, it doesn't mean that it's going to work in China, for example, because there's going to be cultural nuances that mean that. You know there, there are certain things that just don't don't translate so whilst there's a framework in place we very much uh you know like our local markets to take ownership of it and then turn it into what they want it to be it's not kind of there's not it's not a template all over the world honestly and you, you know you see very you know obvious cultural norms that uh that uh that you would expect to see in certain markets but you know certain behaviors so for example i remember when I remember when I went to Poland and, and somebody in my team said, you know, you know, you're, I know you're really you're into your mental health thing. But when you go and speak to Poland, you're, they're not they're not really interested in that. And I was like, OK, well, of course, mental health isn't relevant in Poland. What do you mean by that? And um, and, you know, when I actually went and I spoke to the leadership team in Poland and we talked about mental health. And actually they were hugely engaged and fascinated by it for the reason that actually they don't talk about it very much there. And so actually that's a market where it's really important to kind of raise the conversation. So I think those are, those are kind of quite interesting dynamics when you look at the world and you look at different regions. Um, but I think broadly speaking, whenever, you know, we do a lot, it's something that I'm very focused on from, from a global perspective. It's a really important strategic priority for us as a business globally. And there's no why in the world where anyone says, I don't want to hear about that. That's not interesting. You know, it's really important to, to our people. So. So I, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Hopefully it does. No, look, look, it, it certainly does. And thanks, thanks, Josh. Um, look, going to turn to you now, Sunita. Unilever's operates in over 190 countries and yours is a global role. How are you going about operationalising your mental health strategy and, and really putting in place the GBC Leadership Pledge? Thanks, uh, Robin. It's really a delight to be here speaking with everyone um, and all of you, right? It's so great to be with all of our GBC partners. Um, You know, picking up from where Josh was at, um, and interestingly, Josh mentioned we would definitely have a framework. Of course we do, but um, it doesn't come, you know, as, as linear and as easy as one might think. Mental health is a topic that needs a lot of attention. And particularly for us, with our geographic and demographic diversity, 
it's something that you know we really really needed to make sure worked for all of the regions that we operate in the 190 countries so while we do have a global framework that prescribes how we support mental health uh, the you know the beauty of it is really on how it works within the various cultures how it works within the various geographies with the people the individuals everyone every last individual having the support that they need getting the solutions that they need getting the support that helps them for their particular issue so let me take a minute to just talk about our framework and how we are bringing the gbc pledge that we all put together a couple of years ago how we are bringing that alive our framework is you know it has four pillars uh, the first one of course is leadership because that's where a lot of uh, how we make mental health come alive works right so with our leadership we work extensively with you know really integrated with leadership development to ensure that we offer our leaders training support in recognizing and understanding how they can help our people with their mental health but i think it also is down to enabling culturally so the second pillar is culture and culture is really about what are the conversations that are happening what are people saying to one another how comfortable are they opening up about their vulnerabilities and we really believe that leadership role modeling is a great way to get that going uh, we've got a number of other things that we do in the culture space so you know campaigns like world mental health day opportunities to really speak up we do lots and lots of conversations with experts with people from you know lived experiences and and therefore what we're doing is we're normalizing the conversations on mental health we also in our world mental health day campaign you know just have storytelling from leaders but from people across the business sharing how they got support what helped them um, so the first two pillars leadership and culture is really very much led by us the other two pillars is where we reach out to this large community. Like Josh said, it's for the people of the people by the people. And I think that's really important. So we have formal prevention and support as well, uh, but we depend a lot on our community. So we've had some great outcomes with, you know, building a community of internal mindfulness champions. Uh, we've offered a team energy program that, you know, that essentially helps leaders understand where their team members energy is at. So rather than guesswork or doing a sense check or just asking people in the meeting, how are you feeling? We formalized it with a tool that we've developed with partners uh, who are behavioral experts. And that helps our leaders really get a gauge on what their people are feeling. Uh, I think the most powerful one and the most useful one is, of course, our employee assistance program available 24 seven around the world to everyone. No questions asked. Absolutely confidential. And we've put in a lot of effort in our communications campaigns to put forward the fact that it is confidential. These are external experts that will offer you the support you need. But I think the beauty of it and the unlock has been our mental health champions program which is much like the mental health allies or mental health first aiders that are operating around the world. Now, this was something we started in the heart of the pandemic. We offered people mental health training uh, so that they could have, uh, support colleagues and offer peers a listening ear, non-judgmental support. And what we found was the number of people that signed up to it. It was really, really heartening. So over the years, we've actually trained 4,000 plus people in just two years or as mental health champions. We've given them the language. We've given them the tools, a framework to help their colleagues. And what we love is that very recently in our factories, you know, we've got people working in factories. We've got people working in Salesforce. We've recently, you know, in India done a short uh, program with mental health champions. We've already got almost 700 people trained as mental health champions on the shop floor. So when you talk about the hard to reach places, right, places where stigma is higher, we are finding, you know, different, uh, different reactions to the programs. Obviously, the program was very well received in markets where there is a lot of mental health awareness and literacy. So the UK, we already had a collaboration with mental health first aiders, North America, Australia, New Zealand. We were able to find very, you know, very quickly a lot of takers and people who signed up. Uh, but we were also using an internal model. We were building capability within Unilever. We did not want to just do this with external partners. We wanted to really build you know, the capability within the company. And so we trained people. We asked for volunteers from across the world. And we had to develop materials to train everyone from around the world. Uh, obviously, the cultural nuances, the 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 sort of starting point for a lot of people was where their own understanding of mental health was from. And we had to work with breaking some barriers. You know, there are markets where you can't talk about mental health. You can't talk about certain topics. But over these years, that's actually changed. That has evolved. The more we speak about it, the more people feel 
open to speaking more about it. And, and that, I think, has been such a game changer for us. Uh, you know, the conversations that used to happen at the coffee machine, uh, they now happen virtually. And that's a little harder because you have to actually seek someone out to have a mental health conversation. And I think that's important to be enabled. So we've now got tech that enables this. We've got an app through which people can reach out to mental health champions. We do everything we can to equip our mental health champions, keep giving them you know, newer topics, newer trainings, and ensuring that we help them get a holistic perspective. So most recently in the last quarter, we talked to them a lot about, you know, impact, mental health impact of menopause, uh, parenting. We've talked about subjects like, you know, body, uh, self-image, self-esteem. We equip them with different subjects so that they can constantly help themselves and help others through these conversations. Um, so our program is something we're proud of. And the power of community is something that can make that difference within workplaces. So I would encourage everyone to have a workplace, you know, mental health support program. We certainly at Unilever are very happy to share our own learnings with uh, anyone that wants to get started because we believe peer support is uh, just going to build everyone's awareness and uh, opportunity to help others. So I think for me, in summary, you know, how we are living the pledges, we're addressing stigma, we are building those safe spaces, we're working with support, we're offering formal support, bereavement, you know, it's a journey that will go on and on. It's not something that you can say, there you are, cross the finish line. That's not how it's going to work. It's going to be ceaseless effort. It is part of the way we do business. Our business uh, strategy says people with purpose thrive and you know if they've got the right support at the workplace they will be able to do to be their best and so that's you know the combination of helping people with their well-being and mental health because it's better for the business but also because it's the right thing to do i think that's uh, that's been our approach as well thank you sunita um look i think one of the really great pieces of advice that you had there when dealing with different cultures is is starting where people are at you know, having that conversation and understanding where they're at and, and what their level of mental health literacy is and what, are, you know, some of the other issues are and then sort of tailoring your program so that you're meeting, you know, where they are and, and, and where it's going to be most successful. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, Elizabeth, so look across to you. Stigma's been shown to have a real cost to workforce productivity, um, often exacerbating underlying conditions because... People feel afraid to, to bring themselves, real, you know, really bring their true selves to work to, you know, to seek support or to put their hand up when they're not going so well. Um, so why do you think it's so important as a leader in Hong Kong for you to, experience, you know, to share your own experiences regarding this? Yeah, thanks, Rob. I mean, you're absolutely right. It does have an enormous cost. And to Sunita's point, if we can put interventions much earlier in the stages of people starting to experience symptoms of mental health challenges, we can really, really support them in, in getting back on track. And HSBC is fantastic and puts a lot of time and effort and thought into how we deliver programs. But on a cultural level, something that's designed for a, typically a Western population doesn't necessarily land particularly well. So that grassroots stuff and people doing stuff from the ground up, and I've been in this field for about eight years now, I think that's actually where it really makes a difference once you've got the right frameworks around you. So a long way around of going back to saying why I talk about mine in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, typically there's still an enormous amount of stigma about mental well-being. So in a in the survey done last year, 71% of young adults surveyed said that they would actually disassociate with someone if they knew they had mental health problems. So within the population, there's a real issue around the conversation that we may have been having ourselves for a long time, especially in expat type organizations, that actually when we're working, operating and serving in, in more local communities, I think we've got a real duty to talk about and normalize this conversation about mental well-being and, and why we all suffer. Everyone has challenges at one point in their lives or someone very close to them will, and just normalizing that. So for me as a leader in Hong Kong, it's very important that we keep that conversation going, that we normalize the topic and we create an environment where people can come forward, reach out, whether that's to a peer, as Sunita said, or whether that's to senior management or to any of the help sort of that we provide in the more formal frameworks. But we get very good feedback. We have a lot of senior leaders who are starting to really talk about it now and, and try and remove that stigma. And hopefully that creates a healthier work environment for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um... I knew stigma was high um, in in um, in that region. We've got business in Singapore, and 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 uh, certainly have heard similar things. But seventy one percent of young people, wow, that's um, 
that's that's something. So, you know, the work that you're doing there and sharing your own personal story and, and encouraging other leaders to do likewise, I'm, I'm sure it's having a really significant impact in terms of reducing some of that stigma. Um, how has your experience been received in different markets and, and, and how do you think sharing your experience has landed outside of work, perhaps with, with family and, and friends, as an example? Yeah, great question. So different markets and, and my previous role covered 14 different markets. It is incredibly different. So, for example, we did an event in Sri Lanka and I shared my experience and people reached out afterwards and it was literally a topic that had never been talked about before. It was like if someone had mental health issues within their family, it was covered up, it was hidden, which was very much the environment that I grew up in for my parents as well, which, you know, I think for those of us who talk about this a lot, we forget um, that actually you could be shining a light on something that people haven't talked about for a very long time or just don't talk about at all. So in different markets across all of Asia, it's definitely at different levels. And I think that's where it's important that the grassroots peaks come up, but it's absolutely essential that leaders talk about their experience and I don't leaders aren't always super senior people right it doesn't have to be about role or title that can help certainly in some of our Asian cultures but it a leader is anyone who takes the initiative to drive a change by role modeling something so we always really encourage anyone who has the courage to come forward to talk about it and then when other people see that actually if anything rather than harm it can actually help their careers and and create a better environment for people to work in then they tend to receive that better. That goes all the way to somewhere like Australia, where the conversation is much, much more advanced. It's where I was for eight years before. Um, but even there, you know, a huge amount of work has been done there with the government as well, because it's the highest cause of death amongst males between 20 and 60 in Australia. So, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge, important topic. It's very differently perceived. And I think talking about your personal experience, so when I talk about burning out, people are genuinely really shocked. They don't expect a senior leader to say, I had a huge burnout, I stepped out of the industry, I came back in and it's okay and it's okay to talk about that. People are amazed to then see that, you know, you keep climbing, you keep getting opportunities. But I think when you are that authentic and that transparent, people get to know you as a person and then they start to build trust and they trust that they can also talk about their experience and when they need help, they can reach out. And to the second part of your question, I mean, my friends and family, they're very used to me talking about it. So I don't think that they feel particularly self-conscious about it. I think in the early days, it was more challenging, but they're very used to that being a part of, just hanging around with me, I guess, because I think, again, you, you have to be really authentic about this stuff. I also, they're comfortable with me sharing their own experience as well, because they really fundamentally believe it, it kind of makes us better humans and it makes better work environments. And, and now for our final question, Liz, what's HSBC doing to address stigma across the business? And again, how is this being adapted across different parts of the market? So I have to give kudos to our team working on this. This year for World Mental Health Day, we're, we're really celebrating leaders who talk about mental health and prioritise their mental health. And one way in which we're cascading it across all of those markets, so we're over 50 countries across the world, um, is recording them talking about their experiences, being very, very open about the challenges they've had. And that gets cascaded out in a series of four videos over the course of the month. And we're then effectively having this big mental health conversation. And the entire topic of that conversation is how do we alleviate stigma across the business? So we've got a real-time intranet platform. We're running a two-day live event. And so real-time all around the globe, we've got senior leaders posing questions to our people to say, you know, how do we, how do we actually alleviate stigma about this? What challenges are you facing? How can we make what we provide better? Um, and, and how can we really create that culture in which people talk about it? So some really great initiatives, a really big spotlight on mental health and mental health awareness across the whole firm. And we're really, really looking forward to it. Wow, that, that sounds so tremendous. Really looking forward to sort of hear how that goes when, when we next catch up. But um, such a powerful way of just demonstrating your company's commitment to mental health and for your leaders to be on the front foot and to provide that opportunity and the platform for some interactions on, on this topic. Is, um, is a real credit to, to you and the team there. So, so well done. Thank you. We've seen the crucial and important role that leaders have in accelerating the creation of mentally healthy workplaces across the world. So to close our discussion today, what advice would you give to other leaders looking to champion mental health in their workplace? So let's start with you, Josh. I mean, I think, listen, I think that the fact that everybody is here listening to this now, we've got an engaged group of people who care about this. So I think keep caring, I think would be the first thing I would say. And the second is, um, it's never going to be done. It's a job that's not going to just be nailed and then you can move on and do something else. Like this is what, this is a life, a life's work, I think for all of us. So just keep, keep on doing it and, 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 
never expect it to end. Just keep keep on the journey. Thanks, thanks, Josh. And I, I, I think coming from a place of care as a leader is is, is a super place to, to start from. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it's a journey, and uh, and we're all on it. And let, let's keep going. So thank you so much, uh, Sunita. What about you? What are your thoughts? So for me, I think it would be, you know, to summarize, it would be don't overthink it. You know, you've got to put yourself out there. If you want to build an environment where others can open up, be open to sharing your own vulnerability. People need role models. And as a leader, I think the best way we can serve others in supporting them on their mental health journeys is to not uh, not look surprised or shocked and to be open to always being sort of, you know, sharing your own perspective when you have it. So exactly like Josh said, we're all in it together. Uh, let's keep, you know, helping every individual one after the other so that we can really grow the momentum and help everyone uh, at workplaces as we go along uh, with this journey. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nita. Look, I, I think, you know, vulnerability in leadership, I think that's such a good call out. And, and for, for our leaders to recognise that actually showing, you know, being vulnerable is actually a strength. You know, it's not a sign of weakness. It's absolutely a strength and, uh, and so important in, in this area in particular. So, so thank you. Liz, what about you? What are your thoughts on this one? So I think the only, I mean, two very hard acts to follow, but the, the only thing I would add on to that is think about signing. If you haven't yet signed the pledge, sign the pledge, the GBC pledge, and think about how you're going to put an action plan in place. So absolutely, we need to be vulnerable. Absolutely, we need to create the environments in which people can come forward. But if it doesn't have a plan, quite often it doesn't get done. So put a put an action plan in place, track your progress, be very open and visible in your organization about what you're doing and why, and ask for feedback all the time. I really think that the more we can do that, the more we can strive, but the more we can do those things, the more people can see we're really serious as leadership and as businesses about creating a better business environment. Thank you so much, Josh, Sunita and Liz for, for joining with us here today and, and, and sharing your, your wealth of experience, both your personal experiences and, and how your companies are, are making such a tremendous difference in, in building those workplaces that support mental health. Um, look, reflecting back over what we've heard today, you know, we heard, we heard from Josh that, you know, you know, one of the things that he really sort of sees in terms of their commitment to mental health, is the role it the role it plays in in shaping a culture, um, and and we've seen that at BHP in terms of really sort of shaping that culture of care, but it's it, it also drives business success. And and he talked about you know you know they 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 really strive for a high performance and and a winning type culture as well. And I'm sure most organisations also you know really strive to be high performance. And support for mental health is absolutely conducive with. Um, and, and, and aligned with, you know, driving those high performance cultures, but enabling people to sort of to, to show up, to be their genuine selves, to put their hands up if, if they are experiencing tough times so they can get that support and, and, and get back on track. We heard from both Josh and, and from Sunita, you know, global companies, how rolling out this, you know, some of the considerations for rolling this out. And, um, you know, it starts with having a framework and, and setting some really clear expectations on, on, on what needs to be delivered and the types of supports that need to be in place. But it also needs to be owned locally. Um, and, and we heard from one of the things we heard from Sunita was, was, you know, meeting people where they're at. So, you know, really understanding, you know, what is their level of maturity and what are their needs and then tailoring their, their programs so that it suits that local context. One of the really important things that we heard from Liz was, was on the topic of stigma and the role that leaders play, both formal and informal leaders, through the sharing of personal stories, how that does so much to break down stigma. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's, you know, what HSBC is doing there with their cam campaign coming up and, and, and bringing in, you know, multiple leaders to share those stories and to create that platform, I think is going to come a really long, a, a really you know, long way to, um, to creating that workplace that's, that's supportive of, of great mental health. So you know, lots of takeaway messages from all of our great leaders there and, and hopefully every one of you has taken away one or two points that, um, that you think you can look to introduce across your companies as well. We've also heard that taking the leadership pledge is a really tangible action that you can take today you know, to, to demonstrate to your people how committed you are to their mental health and to putting in, putting in place the types of programs, the types of evidence-based programs 
that we know are going to be successful and help you to create that workplace environment that is going to be so helpful for your people. So I really encourage every organisation, you know, every one of you, to, to download the pledge and join our community of committed and visionary business leaders. The future of Healthy Minds rests with us and we're on a mission to make sure no one is left behind. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my huge delight to be chairing this session and to be joined by such, such tremendous leaders and, um, and really you know, urge you to take this on and, um, and, and join us here at the GBC. So thank you all. Thank you all on, on this World Mental Health Day. Um, look, on that note, I'll hand back to, to Robin, um, who's got uh, um, you know, some closing remarks to make and, and, and also to provide some um, uh, tangible uh, uh, references and, and support and how you can download the pledge and, and join us here at GBC. So Robin, over to you. Thank you, Rob, for steering us so brilliantly through our conversation today and to echo your thanks to our speakers for sharing their insights, their learning and expertise so generously with us. And also a big thank you to all of you in our audience for joining us today and really demonstrating your commitment to mental health within your organisation. We've seen the pivotal role of workplace leaders and their role in creating and sustaining positive action for workplace mental health. So we invite all of you here today and leaders around the world to join us, demonstrate your commitment and take tangible action by signing our leadership pledge. The pledge supports you and your organisation to make mental health a visible priority in every territory that you operate in. And it provides a framework through the six pledge areas to support your organisation put in place the foundations to create a mentally healthy workplace. You'll find more details on our leadership pledge coming up on your screens now. There's no financial cost to signing, so I really encourage all of you to register your interest on our website and we will share a pledge information pack with you that includes more information on next steps. Or if you're ready to sign the pledge now, you'll find details on the screen of how to do so also. No one business has all the answer to workplace mental health, but Together, as we've seen today, we can really accelerate our collective journey to create more open, welcoming, supportive and inclusive workplace environment where all our colleagues and people can thrive. And we look forward to you joining us to continue this journey together. Thank you.